Stanford University. After this, um, you can catch more of these talks in the fall. I assume we'll start up in September at some point. Um, if you're taking this class for credit, we do have an assign up sheet. And if you have missed more than two of these lectures, you need to make arrangements with Power I about how to get credit. Um, you were only supposed to miss up to two. So uh, I'll also email you if you if you're haven't completed at least seven of these lectures or eight of these lectures this quarter. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. This is uh, Dr. Jacob Wolbrook from University of Washington. He's a, an assistant professor in the information school. And he actually did his undergrad here at Stanford in CS, correct? Symbolic systems. Symbolic systems, sorry. Uh, and he did his PhD at CMU. Mm -hmm. And take it away. OK, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> it's great to be back at, at my alma mater. I've I have a lot of fond memories, and as I walk around, I realize that your memory of things is not ever quite exactly like they really are. You kind of, you know, the edges get a little foggy, and you think it's a certain way, and then you see it, and you realize, that's different than I remembered. So it's kind of a fun experience. Um, I also, uh, along with a symbolic systems undergrad degree from here, uh, have a master's, a co-term master's uh, in CS, where Terry Winograd was my advisor. So um, my HCI roots are very much here, and I wouldn't be up here speaking today about any of this if it wasn't for Terry and for Symbolic Systems and for CS and HCI in general here. So it's um, really lovely for me to be back. Uh, it's kind of a homecoming for me personally. Uh, I'm talking today about back to basics, making uh, pointing accessible. And um, I realize that may not be the sexiest title in the world, you know, pointing, whoa, let's go see that talk. But I'm hoping by the end you see there's a lot to this. Uh, there's been a lot to it for many years, and there's a lot to it um, even still, and it's a pretty exciting area. Um, as Stephen mentioned, I am a professor in the Information School at the University of Washington, and uh, that's part of the larger Dub Group, which is a consortium of HCI and design departments, or people in departments that are interested in HCI and design, and uh, the iSchool is very much part of that, along with computer science, human-centered design and engineering, and the design division within the School of Art. Uh, I run the AIM Research Group. Uh, the, the name is a, a little bit of a pun, but it stands for Accessible, Interactive, and Mobile. Those are the kinds of computing experiences we're interested in. This is a sort of a poster of people and uh, projects, but my point in showing this, uh, besides to look like we're very active, which I think we are, is also to give a lot of credit to the people on this slide. I'll, I'll mention them as we go, uh, but a lot of the work which I'm talking about today spans multiple papers, multiple projects. It's kind of a theme. Hopefully, you'll, the story will be clear. And uh, of course, my grad students and postdocs deserve a lot of credit. Let's start with a problem. So it's no surprise to anyone in this room that uh, once we were here, and, uh, and there's a lot that changed for people of all types when we moved from here to here. Uh, and we could spend an entire class, an entire quarter, probably a year or more, talking about those differences. I'm sure many of you have in your classes and so forth. But one difference I want to highlight to you is we go from a fairly, I think it's fair to say, targetless space, a kind of a 1D space, to a target full or target filled space, a 2D space, right? That's pretty clear. And not just the icons on the desktop, but all the little things down at the bottom, right? And they're, they're small. I wanted to see uh, how extreme this could get, so I did a quick search. And, you know, I don't know if this is a really a used desktop by anyone. Uh, but the fact that it even existed for, for a moment for someone to make a screenshot is kind of uh, frightening. Um, but you can imagine trying to find targets here, right? Especially if you're doing it through human visual search as opposed to automated search or some other ways. And targets aren't just around. They're actually often very small. Uh, any of you who use Outlook would know if you use the notes feature, that resize border on Outlook notes is one pixel in size. Why anyone would design a resize border to be one pixel? It's like either don't put it there or you know make it bigger. It's beyond me, but there it is. Uh, you can see other examples of very small targets. I'm sure going to admit, even on my own website, I have a few little small icon type targets. But small targets are everywhere. Dense targets are everywhere, uh, and it's only getting more so as we get to shrunken smaller devices and computing experiences. So I, I think you can agree with me. I hope you'll agree with me that pointing and clicking is at least today how we do things pretty fundamental to graphical user interfaces. There are other ways to interact. Of course, we can do things through keyboard shortcuts and stuff. But by and large, our activity amounts to, to this. And part of today is to question, must it be that way? 
You know, must that be the way we interact? Must it be the only way we interact? Must it be the dominant way we interact? And what about for people who have challenges, particular challenges with motor control uh, in that area? Uh, a lot of studies show results like this. 60%, not even quite 60% of people who indicate a need for adaptations in their use of computers actually use them. Um, so a, a great number of people who do uh, need something are not really using it. And they, they often try things and abandon them. And the same reasons keep coming up over and over after 20, 30, 40 years of this kind of research. Um, cost is by far the biggest one. Uh, but the complexity of uh, specialized, particularly specialized adaptive technologies, that's a, a configuration for a speech recognition system. Uh, customization, the need to customize things for kind of each individual user is a real challenge. And maintenance, things break down, need to be repaired, need to be fixed, and so forth. Especially for non kind of mainstream technologies that uh, you can't just take into a Best Buy or get a new one. When we look at our um, target subject population, our participants for whom we're designing, we see a lot of, of this which is the use of everyday input devices, common devices, cheap, readily available, they're in the library, they're in the community center, devices, but used in different ways than we'd expect, particularly, for example, in that top center picture. Right? That's a person who uses a trackball with their chin every day. That's how that person interacts. Um, but even the back of the hands, multiple hands, different postures, and so forth. These are pretty typical positions. So they're using devices, but how many of you think the designers of these devices thought about these kinds of postures when they were considering the designs? Probably not, right? Probably not. So, so we try to focus on the use of everyday input devices in some innovative ways because they're cheap, they're readily available. If they break, you just get a new one, you know, 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever. Uh, it avoids a lot of those problems. Now we have projects in all these areas and I'd love to be here for more time to talk about all of them. Today we're gonna focus just kind of on the right side, um, the mouse and the trackball, meaning we're talking about pointing as the title suggested, but uh, I'd love to talk to you about other ways to use those other devices in innovative ways. When we talk about pointing, we need to have a little background information here uh, because some of you maybe haven't considered pointing at this kind of lower level. Um, but pointing tends to occur, uh, at least in uh, kind of the average case, in, in phases. There's a ballistic phase in which the cursor or the hand, you can really think about it as the hand, but we'd see it as the cursor, shoots out in the general area of the target and then performs corrections around the target to get inside the area of pixels that the computer recognizes the target. So it may look, you know, something like this. This isn't from real data, but. So you have this initial ballistic shot that's fast, and then you have these corrections that occur at the end. And from a velocity profile, we call this a sub-movement profile. It might look something like that. That's stylized, that's not raw data, but I think you get the idea. Now when we look at people who have different motor control challenges, we see uh, very commonly data like this. This is from Faustina Huang uh, in Britain. And what we see, this is a group of uh, people, they have different uh, health conditions, different um, sources of impairment, but they all have motor control problems. And you can see uh, different kind of, for what we might call a sort of star-shaped corrective pattern around the target. So there's an example. And if I kind of stylize that, it looks something like this. And so uh, here we can see, again, this ballistic phase, right, where we shoot out near the target that occupies very short time and then this corrective phase. So that's a little bit of background on kind of how pointing works. Now when we talk about uh, average cases and, and kind of maybe you or me, we might see this. And these, these profiles are well established from motor psychologists. David Meyer uh, is a, a well-known one who established that, you know, usually we see around two to four sub-movements. It's not too often you land in the target after the ballistic phase. And by the way, if you didn't know, ballistic means uncorrected or uncorrectable. So a ballistic missile after launch cannot be re-steered. So it's headed some, hopefully not to Stanford, you know, it's somewhere else, but it's not a heat seeking missile that can kind of correct or, or a steerable missile. Uh, in the case of people with uh, motor control problems, motor control challenges, we might see six to 12 or more sub movements. I'll show you an actual example from real data later, uh, but it, it often involves a lower peak initial velocity, although spasticity might make it higher, and then a number of corrections that follow that point. Now, I just want to highlight something that this talk's not going to address, but I do a lot of work uh, in gestures and on surface and other uh, touch surfaces and things. And if, if, I'm not sure this is exactly our future, but if something like this is our future or could be part of our future, I think the challenges only get harder for people with uh, certain motor control problems and motor impairments, for example. Here, the, the woman's hand is, is, is elevated. The arm has to come in and reach. Uh, there's a, a leaning uh, necessary here for this particular design because your legs can't go under the table. Uh, and then, you know, if we take this even further, you know, 
I think the challenge has become even more clear. I mean, this is hard for anybody, right? If you want to practice, hold your arms. Uh, it's okay. I'm giving you permission as your speaker. Hold your arms out for the next three minutes, and we'll see where you're at then. Uh, you, you'll experience something called gorilla arm, where your arms begin to feel like they weigh you know, 300 pounds each, like they're the arms of a gorilla, and you won't be able to do this. So uh, clearly, the, the challenges for everybody are going to become uh, exacerbated if that's where we're headed. Uh, a little bit of related work, because I want you to know this is an old area. The, the area being uh, target acquisition. It's not like this is the first talk by any stretch that's ever been offered on target acquisition. Uh, and so some notable examples. So area cursors, like you see on the top, I, uh, I like animation in PowerPoint, I, you have to forgive me. Um, but the area cursor technique is a larger than single point space to acquire targets. Uh, if it overlaps multiple targets, the traditional approach is to degenerate to the point cursor of the crosshairs you see in the center. There's some variations on that. Below this is a bubble cursor, which is still the fastest general purpose pointing technique in the world. Um, I actually spent a couple months trying to beat it. I have some good ideas of, I think, how, but I haven't succeeded yet. So maybe I'll talk about that some other time. Um, but it's a very fast technique. And what it does is it always con contains the nearest target to the center. So there's a target that's always selected. Now, a couple of points here. One is both of these techniques actually have to be target aware. And we're going to talk about that in a little while. But being target aware is a serious demand on the system because it has to know where all targets are and their dimensions. That's not actually easy, both from an engineering point of view or a theoretical point of view, and we'll come back to that later. They also fail in this case of small, dense, densely packed targets, which are the very kind of target situations that people with motor control problems have the most trouble with. So they fail where we need them most in that sense. Uh, steady clicks is a technique that, um, well, I'll just tell you what it does. It, curse, it freezes the cursor when the mouse button is down. It ignores clicks that occur uh, when the velocity of the cursor is greater than a quarter pixel per millisecond. And it ignores clicks that occur when another button's already down. Seems fairly straightforward, right? Simple stuff, but actually really effective. I don't expect you to appreciate this graph other than to see the light gray is lower than the dark gray, and, and um, lower is better here. So this is from Sherry Trowin. Uh, there's been another look at setting the gain. So the gain is the control display gain that governs how much you get of cursor movement on the screen from movement on the desk. And it's uh, in Windows, at least, it's set on the control panel. So some of you may have gone in and changed that. Uh, pointer acceleration is the checkbox below it. That gives you a nonlinear transfer function between the desk and the screen. And so the question here was, is there a just right gain setting? That's where the word Goldilocks right, comes from, not too hot, not too cold. Is there a just right gain setting for people with motor control problems? And can we automatically set that? And it turns out they could get about a 2% improvement on pointing efficiency. So not really. It's very hard to detect. It's very hard to, to sort that out. Uh, virtual edges and corners provide for some pointing benefits. So if you have a Mac and you hit the top of the screen, every time that happens, you're getting some benefit. Windows finally made it so a maximized window has the close box in the corner. There used to be a one pixel border. Like, talk to Stucard and don't do that. Um, but nonetheless, they finally have fixed that. So we'll never see that problem again. Similarly with the start menu, you didn't know I had an exhibit behind me here. Um, how many of you have gone from this situation to a multi-monitor situation and now there's a screen here, and then you just spend like all day going like this over that thing because you're used to trapping at the corner. Okay, one person raised their hand, thank you. Um, physical edges and corners might be relevant too, especially on, now they're kind of, so the Apple's made this part harder of my talk because now there's no longer elevated bezels around screens, but there used to be. And we could do things like put a keyboard around the edges. Um, visual search time here killed motor performance benefit, but it was an interesting exploration. And that turned into edge right, which is a stroke uh, alphabet I created, kind of like graffiti back in, the old days of 2003, uh, where you wrote within a square that supported the movement of people, particularly with tremor. It was very accurate. Um, this went on, EdgeWrite went on to be in many other devices and things. Barrier pointing says, can we actually leverage the screen bezel in interesting ways? Why don't we lay out player controls, especially the slider on the left along the edge? And we found that different techniques work well there, especially lift off selection, uh, which is that middle one there. Just giving you a sense of what's been done. I know I'm not spending much time on each of these slides yet. Uh, swabbing was just a chi. So this is still a current you know, area of research where the idea was you could select targets by moving towards them. You have to relay out the screen around the edges, which is a serious limitation. But they did find by attaching an accelerometer to the person's finger that tremor in, in tremulous users was reduced by allowing them to have their finger on the screen. So uh, it's using the screen as, as effect as a support, which is kind of an interesting idea. Windows supports a couple uh, ways to avoid pointing, really. Mouse grid is one. You have to use speech recognition. You say mouse grid, and then you recursively uh, say numbers that correspond to these regions that get you to your target. So you have to have voice recognition. You have to say numbers multiple times. If you just want to say one number, you can use the show numbers technique. This is actually my email. I, I double checked. There's nothing scandalous here. Um, and what it does is it flashes a number over every target that it can tell is on the screen. So it's a target aware technique. And uh, 
there's a question, right? I mean, hmm, what's going on here? You can't access my email. I couldn't access my email messages if I used this technique. It doesn't see them. These are actually the targets I care about most. What's above those are just groups of messages. But as soon as I uncollapse those, I can't see them. So that's a, a drawback. And that's the problem with target aware techniques. So that's the kind of thing that's been done to address some of these challenges. Now I'm going to go into the work we've done. Uh, this particular part was done with Christoph Gaios, who's a professor now at Harvard. And it was looking at a different way of acquiring targets on the desktop. I submit to you that most of what we do on a desktop is push buttons. There are a few things that don't amount to that kind of motor control, but really in the end we push buttons. We, we push the mouse button, so that's a physical button, but then we also click a lot of buttons on the screen. Uh, scroll bars are a little different when we drag and so forth, although the mouse wheels made that different. I want to question whether pushing buttons is the right thing in the case of looking at accessibility challenges. Maybe a different metaphor is in order, like crossing switches. So what's push? Push looks like this, right? What, is a what are the demands on the user to do this? You have to isolate the area of the world that corresponds to the target, and you have to bring the finger in unsupported. I guess their hand could be on the table in this particular image, but kind of in general, there's a lack of sort of support. There's no boundaries or edges helping you. And you have to push that localized area. Compare that to this. So what if the GUI backdrop could be said to be kind of this? What would that be? And how would that look? So what's here? You can move through a plane, which is the wall, which provides support, and cross, in this case, multiple targets or goals at once, and maybe get a kind of a crude benefit that way. And, um, and, and it's, a, it's a very different action, right? You can follow through as arbitrarily far, and it's still going to work. I think that could look like this, OK? So this is crossing in the sort of purest form. Now, I didn't invent crossing. That's, I'm not taking credit for having invented it. Um, but my question is, could crossing be more accessible than pointing? Could this action be more accessible than pointing? So remember these, right? Um, what if we had, instead of localized areas of the screen that, that were the targets, we had a crossing goal there? Well, we can see there if the person may, I mean, they might behave differently, but if they had the same trace, they would cross that threshold. And similarly, around, around the ring, we can imagine thresholds maybe being easier to localize than confined areas of the screen. Um, crossing's been around. It wasn't invented in this paper either, but it was used here in a drawing program, but importantly, with pen-based interfaces where you can fly in, cross something, and fly away. So that's probably not as an accessible solution. Certainly isn't relevant entirely to the desktop with a mouse or trackball because of this problem. Let's call this the occlusion problem. I want the goal up above. I'm down here with this nasty persistent cursor that can't ever disappear, which is usually good, but problematic here because as I move, whoops, you know, I triggered something I didn't mean to. Now you might be thinking, why not just use a different signal? How about the mouse button? I'm not holding it down here, and I hold it down up there. That's fine, except you've just given us now a drag operation, or mostly a drag operation, which is precisely very difficult for people with motor impairments, particularly with a trackball. Anyone ever tried to drag and drop with a trackball? Yeah, just be thankful that you don't have to do that too often. It's really hard, and uh, it's, it's really not what we want. So I think uh, we, we'd like, ideally, to get away from that. Also, if we can, let me go back one slide. If we can get away from that, we can maybe utilize this kind of design elsewhere, like on a laser pointer on a large screen or something like that, something uh, Terry's worked on a lot. OK, so uh, we ran a study just to see, is there a performance benefit with crossing? Because if there's not, let's not bother and we'll go do something else. You know? uh, but if there is, maybe we can leverage that. So uh, I'm going to show a lot of studies today. I don't have time to go into the kind of detail I would if I had a talk on each paper, on each study. Uh, but you can generally get the gist. We had balanced groups of people with and without motor impairments, roughly gender balanced, some trackball and mouse users. Um, and the way we, unfortunately, are kind of left to characterize our, our participants is through their health condition, which really tells you nothing about their functional profile. And that's itself a research topic for another day. How do you uh, adequately kind of describe people's functional ability apart from their health condition? The task was one from moving from the inside out. Uh, to circles, kind of like you saw before. And so the crossing targets were of the same diameter as the circles. Uh, that's the closest kind of control we can provide there. And we defined a miss. Um, for in the clicking case, should be fairly obvious. In the crossing case, we had a very sort of strict definition, I think, of a miss, which is you cross anywhere through the extended uh, line of the, the crossing goal, but not over the, the segment itself. So that's a pretty strict definition, because you could be way off somewhere else. Uh, doing other things, and it may not cause any harm in a real user interface, but uh, that's how we defined it. So when we look at movement time, people without motor impairments uh, were faster with crossing than, than pointing. That's kind of interesting. These are, these are statistically significant. 
Uh, I'm not going to flash a bunch of p-values at you today. Uh, and uh, people with motor impairments were even more so. So the, the, the findings were even stronger, particularly with the trackball. That was a nice result. So it seems like, at least in movement time, there's a little benefit. But when we look at the misses, although we are comparing a little bit of apples and oranges, we see people crossing had more misses, both uh, the people without motor impairments and, and with. So under those definitions of misses, there were some more uh, misses. Now, a little bit of pointing theory uh, is appropriate here because we want to look at fitting Fitz Law models, which we know can model crossing from work Schumann Zai has done and others, and, and traditional pointing. And uh, I'll just draw your attention to this column. So if any of you have ever tried to hit human, fit human behavioral data to anything that produces an R-squared, you'll know that you usually don't get things above 0.9. The nice thing about Fitz Law is you often do. And we had pretty good model fits is what I want to show you here. Everything was above 0.9. And when we look at throughput, we see that people without motor impairments were, so in the mouse, they were lower, and the trackball, they were lower uh, in terms of their throughput. The nice thing about throughput is it's a combined speed accuracy efficiency measure. So uh, it helps kind of normalize someone who's fast and inaccurate and someone who's slow and more accurate. So we can compare. Uh, but people with motor impairments were actually more uh, efficient, better throughput with crossing than with pointing which is kind of interesting. So we see a bit of an interaction here, a bit of a flip across the groups. And that flip persisted into the subjective comparisons. So when we ask them on a one to five scale, did they like or dislike uh, pointing or crossing? We see people who are motor impaired actually liked it better, uh, and people who were liked crossing better, and people who were not motor impaired disliked it more. That interaction was significant. And similarly with how difficult or easy they thought it was, and how slow or fast they thought it was. So it seems like people's performance sort of followed their uh, subje or their subjective preferences followed their performance. Kind of interesting. Do you like things you do well with? Yeah, maybe. Do you like the major you picked because you get good grades in it? Or are you just like banging your head against something that's too hard? You know? Usually we like things that we're good at, I think. Anyway, that's what we saw there. But this leaves open a lot more of a question now, right? How can goal crossing actually improve desktop accessibility? Okay, so fine, Wobrock, you show a, a bunch of circles and they move, but that's nothing like interacting on a real desktop, right? How can we do this for real? Well, I think that question now was warranted, so we looked at first putting this kind of design in the widgets, in the targets. And there's a number of PhD students here who helped me, uh, including Yun Kyung, Christian Shinohara, Parmeet Chalana, and um, Morgan Dixon. So remember this problem. Whoops, right? I hit something along the way. I don't want to use the mouse button if I can't help it. Uh, Maybe we can do something here. So we embarked on hopefully what uh, Professor Klemmer would call a good design process. And uh, we followed a lot of uh, iteration, a lot of ideation, a lot of idea generation, brainstorming, and so forth, and made a number of sketches, a lot of which involved sort of two stages. I'm almost cut off there, but you can see the start of the movements here. Um, you maybe cross and then click anywhere. So it's using the button, but without targeting. Uh, maybe other things, little gestures, and so forth. Uh, we implemented all of these to sort of feel them and try them out informally. We went to context menus and folder selection and other things, and uh, even had some class projects. So this was something uh, some students of mine made called Reels, where you actually interacted with the world from the center of a kind of, a, think of the desktop in polar coordinates, right? Instead of in Cartesian land. So you move from the center out and then uh, select things that way, and then they kind of roll into the middle. It'd be nice to show a video of this. I actually don't have one. I should have uh, insisted they make one. But anyway, it, it was this kind of spherical desktop world. Uh, here you're seeing a glimpse of one side of that. So where did this lead? It led to a realization that maybe to you seems obvious, but to us uh, came as a result of this work. And that was a design space that had really two main axes that we had to, to work with. One was trying to maximize the ease of motor performance uh, for people with motor impairments. Make these things easy, because if you add too much, then you're going to lose that performance benefit. But at the same time, if you can see down in the bottom right, we had to consider the safety, what we called safety which is how likely or not likely is it that you trigger something unwantedly, you know, accidentally. And of course, these are totally opposed to each other. Because if I make something easy to do, I might do it accidentally. And if I make something hard to do, it's going to be safe, but now it's hard to do. So finding this corner was, I think maybe, gosh, it's a dangerous word to say impossible, but it felt like it. And we could get closer than uh, in some of these designs, but it never really panned out. So we, uh, we kind of paused there and we went into considering the cursor itself, and I'll come to that in a moment. I do want to highlight one thing, which is there are architectural issues here uh, from an input perspective as well, from the way input systems are designed with event queues and stuff. For one thing, widgets typically don't care about things that don't happen in their borders. 
this button doesn't know or care about these. They don't exist, right, if the mouse is there. It just doesn't happen. Uh, it can be made to happen through capture and some other things, but it generally doesn't happen. Uh, similarly, when you build a widget, you have to give it some kind of definable area or it doesn't exist. Let's say we have a crossing goal like this, and then let's say we move across it. Come on. And, you know, we get one input point inside that space, perhaps, right? It, that's not across to that widget's perspective because things only occur inside that area. So you have to do things like have all the widgets report themselves to some central repository, which serves as kind of a secondary event queue to pump things out to the right people to, or the right widgets at the right time. Um, similarly, on the output side, here's a design that we based on Toby Grossman's hover widgets for a pen, uh, where uh, as we move, we get this kind of L-shaped widget that moves with us, and we can make this little right turn and, and trigger the, the widget. That seemed like a nice idea. It felt pretty good, actually, even with a mouse. Uh, and, uh, and yet, we have to paint, if we want to draw that thing, outside the control, which is possible, but, you know, not easy. All of the input systems we deal with have this, have this bias towards things happening inside them or the things that matter. And so when you try to push things, you, you find out these kinds of problems. They're all surmountable, but they are kind of a pain and almost ask for a, a crossing toolkit to solve the problem. Okay, what if we put crossing in the cursor? Let's flip this on its head and not stick things in widgets. Let's put them in the cursor. So that led us to the next project. This was uh, published at WIST and involved more people, some of whom I named. Leah Finlater was, and Alex Jansen, the first two people there, uh, were heavily involved. So we had a few aims here. They're not unlike the aims we've seen so far, but let's enumerate them. We wanted to reduce the need for corrective phase pointing. You've seen that correction uh, stuff happen at the end of pointing. Reduce the challenge of tiny targets, right? Let's make the tiny targets not be so overwhelmingly hard and reduce the need for steady clicking. Um, and so we developed four cursors, actually many more than that, but I'm gonna show you four and start with two. These are the crossing cursors. Uh, the one on the left is click and cross. I know that's a wonderfully sexy name. Uh, and the second one is cross and cross. But they'll they're descriptive and they'll help us remember what they are. And to show you this, I'm just going to play little videos and explain while you see it. So these are area cursors. And as the cursor moves, uh, the area, or as, as the cursor overlaps things, when it's expanded with a click, then all the targets under the cursor become proxied as crossing goals at the outside of the cursor. So whatever's overlapped can be crossed. Now there's a lot more to this I won't go into involving where do you put things on the arcs and how does it feel like it's where the user expected to see it. It actually took a long time to work out the, the right kind of intuitive algorithm for placement of those arcs. Uh, but that, that's the idea there. And so now you only have to be as accurate as the area cursor demands. Here's it working on the New York Times webpage and you can see uh, we, we put in like error correction. So if I cross something and don't want it, as long as I keep moving, I can come back in and cross something else. Um, and I don't know if you noticed, let's actually replay that real fast. The uh, targets that are proxied are highlighted in the original page as they're crossed. It's kind of light, but I think you can see it. Uh, so there's some feedback and things at work here. Uh, and it can support uh, right clicking and a few other things as well, but I won't go into those now. Um, this cursor is the cross and cross, which is like a tracking menu that's dragged by the point cursor. And then the back of the cursor, the red arc is crossed to trigger the expansion. And uh, so it's very much the same, except the trigger is not a click. And this, I think, is the world's first click-free cursor. Uh, I'm not sure how much that's worth, but, <laughs> but it's kind of an interesting exploration. Now, we did develop a number of other things involving row column scanning under an area cursor and a few other things. We had something called the spider cursor, but it was not as cool as Spider-Man, so we didn't go forward with that. Um, but there's um, just a number of things that we tried, but those were kind of the things that we coalesced on. We also ended up involving some magnification, which might sound to you like, oh, that's been done. But actually, I think you'll see that uh, this is kind of, kind of new, uh, even while seeming old. We had the visual motor magnifier and the motor magnifier, which is a control condition on the right. Okay? And I'll explain what these are. But to give you background so you can appreciate what's happening, I'm going to delve briefly into motor space and visual space. So I don't know if you've ever thought of your computer this way. Uh, maybe you have. But your screen is mirrored on your desktop. Now, I actually did a project that has projectors on the laptop that can project this onto the desk, so you can have a side display, a surface display. But even without that, you don't have to see it. It's there, because that's what you're actually moving in. And it, that's called the motor space. And so there's a correspondence between these that's governed by the transfer function. And that might be linear, it might be nonlinear, but that's what's governing this, this mapping, right? Okay, so maybe no surprise there. A high gain would mean the motor space is small. So now targets are close together. Good. But now they're small. Bad, right? Again, from a perspective of someone with motor control problems. Um, but a high gain would allow us to move through this space um, without a lot of distance of movement. Okay? 
And similarly, a low gain now targets are bigger, good, but farther away, bad. So you don't get much win from a uniform translation or uh, uniform scaling of the motor space. Um, but we can have motor spaces uh, in low and high gain situations corresponding to visual space. That's different than you've probably seen magnification. Okay? Uh, when, we, when we come to motor space magnification, that's different than what you've maybe seen. This is the Windows uh, magnifier, and it splits the screen in one configuration and showing a, a zoomed in view at the top, but you move through the regular space, right? So you move through the motor space that is still uh, what you'd move through if this wasn't running. It's just a magnified visual space. So there's no motor improvement here. It's great, of course, if you have low vision or something like that, that might be very helpful. So with that background, let me show you. Uh, this is the visual motor magnifier because we're gonna have magnification that occurs both in visual space and in motor space. So the cursor space it moves through does not change even when magnified. And you can see there's a little inset bubble cursor that is active uh, to just make target selection a little bit easier, although it's probably not helping that much there. So that's the visual motor magnifier. And then as a control condition, this is just the motor magnifier. So by now you can maybe guess, you're not gonna see a visual change, but we're changing the motor space identically to the visual motor magnifier so that there's an exact comparison from a motor space point of view. That allows us to, uh, to compare them in, uh, as a control condition. Back to this uh, study, because we need to know what kind of effects these things are having on our users. And um, so we had 12 people with and without motor impairments, mostly gender balanced. Well, not really in the, in the, in the <laughs> not gender balanced in the uh, without impairments condition, but better in the with. Um, the factors, so we had six levels of the cursor factor. This is the experimental design. Uh, the four that you've seen, we also added the bubble cursor because of its, you know, kind of stature in the, in the cursor world and the point cursor, because we want to compare to how things are done now. Uh, we had three target sizes and we had a number of uh, target spacings, that's the top part here. No spacing, half a target, and full target. That's around the desired target to select. And then we had low clutter and high clutter uh, on the screen. So what you're seeing here is this kind of setup that involves, you have to have distractor targets because these are target aware techniques, right? The, the crossing and the bubble cursors are. Uh, the magnification ones are not. So the target's here and you can see, it, I think it has half target or maybe full target spacing there. So what did we learn? Whoops. Um, so here's some of the results by cursor. And I'll just highlight a few things. I can't be exhaustive, and I won't be exhaustive today. But the, um, the bubble cursor, the visual motor magnifier, and the click and cross cursor were fastest, particularly for the, the smallest target size, which is the green bars. Are they green on the TV? Maybe they look blue to anyone in TV land, but here they look green, and they're the four pixel size. And so um, that was kind of important because we want to keep small targets easy. We can also see that th uh, the point cursor, bubble cursor, and motor magnifier all kind of degraded the most as targets got small. So those increases were more pronounced than here uh, for the visual motor magnifier, click and cross and cross and cross cursors. From an error point of view, we see, you know, remember point is what everyone today is kind of dealing with. So um, we want to compare to that. And we can see a lot of errors on the small targets, but compared to the cursors we created, uh, we actually did a good job, I think, of keeping small targets, particularly, and in general, all targets, fairly error free. Um, so that was nice. Now, I talked a lot earlier about sub-movements, and I want to highlight that again, because that's very important when we look at how much uh, uh, correction behavior is happening. So here's a trace from actual data uh, by, I think, a person with cerebral palsy. Uh, and uh, you can see this kind of traveling towards the target, and then a bunch of what looks like sort of scribbling around the target, right, trying to get in. If I tell you that took 3.5 seconds, the timeline kind of starts to hint at the answer, but how much time do you think was spent on the corrective phase of pointing? Because all of that happened just right here, right? So this person spent 22 seconds in this pattern. And that's, that's a lot of time. Now, um, th this, wasn't, this was a little bit on the high side, but no, we did not pick like the longest trial and uh, I'm trying to pass it off as somehow typical. Yeah. How do you figure out what's the holistic part and what's the well, corrective and also repeated ballistic part. Right. Uh, great question. When you say you, do you mean uh, sort of humans looking at graphs, or do you mean like I guess it might be the same answer, but uh, or automated ways like when we parse our logs and stuff? Or are you asking? Either way. Either way. So I mean, in general, we want to find um, uh, the ballistic phase is going to have a much higher, obviously, velocity profile, and we can see a few peaks here. Um, 
part of that is due to the aliasing, temporal aliasing that, and spatial through the pixel grid that happens. We, we always see some jaggies, even, and then we smooth a bit. Um, and I'm not, this was such a long movement. If you zoomed in, this green would look smoother than it does. Uh, and then the if you look at the velocity peaks here, we see all the way till we get up here, which maybe is another attempt at a kind of a ballistic jerk. It could also just be a spastic or involuntary type behavior. Um, and, and then we continue on. For our purposes, we didn't try to find subsequent ballistic behavior after the first phase. So as soon as we said that's a percentage, you know, enough of a drop, we moved on. Um, so there, you know, there might be a little noise in that kind of analysis, but it's. And you have or in the beginning of your talk, you showed 12 to 22 mm -hmm. corrections. Yeah. Is that actually you counted them in there 12 to 22, or that's just conceptually what one might see? Right, that, that, phase, or that uh, range on that side was 6 to 12 plus, because it can be more. Here's more. Um, that wasn't from our data. That was from the work I cited under that, uh, which is kind of typical. The, the problem with that kind of average is there is no real typical in this kind of population, right? So it's a little uh, more conceptual and just kind of gestalt than precise. Um, you know, it also depends on what you count. I mean, are each of these little teeny peaks a sub-movement? Probably not, you know. So you have to set your, your filters right and your smoothing, you know. We, we did a lot where we have tools where we can see this and see what our parsing produced and make sure it corresponds to what a human might count. You know, if you just said, that's a submovement, that's a submovement, that's a submovement, and so forth. Good questions, thanks. So when we look at the submovements under, um, from, from that kind of data, we do see a reduction from the bubble cursor, uh, although for the four, target, four pixel targets, it's a little bit higher. Visual motor magnifier and click and cross are, are lower, again. Um, so that's kind of nice. And in the end, uh, at least for the cursors we created, we see both in speed, errors, and sub-movements, um, some nice benefits coming out of those two cursors. When we asked people just for their preference, a pretty simple measure, but an important one, we saw that seven, this is of the motor impaired participants, seven of them uh, preferred the visual motor magnifier, but three preferred cross and cross, which is actually one of the slower ones because you have that extra movement to, for the trigger, and, uh, but they liked it. The click and cross was two people, and no one actually picked the bubble cursor out of 12. Now, these aren't statistically significant because there's just not enough people, but that's interesting to us because to these participants, all the cursors were novel. They'd never seen the bubble cursor before, so there's not, I don't think, a novelty effect happening. And it's still the general, fastest general purpose cursor. If you went and used these, you'd probably perform the best with the bubble cursor. But it just didn't uh, capture people's fancy. We do have some quotes that give some insight, at least in comparison to point, the point cursor. Point is just more difficult to do. With the other ones, you don't have to be right on. That's a pretty fair description of how they work, including the bubble cursor. Uh, you had to use more energy with point to click on targets. That was interesting because it suggests a sort of effort um, sentiment there. So from this, we saw that enhanced area cursors can reduce uh, fine pointing correction for users' motor impairments and improve selection of small, densely packed targets. And that seemed promising. And so then we led from that to ask the question, well, which of these cursors can we make you know, for real? What do I mean by for real? Well, something you could go download and use right now on your machine, well, assuming you have a Windows machine, <laughs> uh, that you could use, right? And, and actually, there's, there's more to that question than just an engineering effort. So this leads us to the next uh, phase of the work, the pointing magnifier, which was in, uh, Alex Jansen and Lee and Finlater were involved in. And it leads us to this point I raised earlier that's um, actually quite, quite essential to, to, to appreciate. There are target aware and target agnostic pointing techniques. And uh, they're far more target aware ones. What do I mean by target aware? Target aware means that target positions, their dimensions, even maybe their types, what type of widget or what type of target is it. You may need to move targets or resize them or make proxies for them. We saw that with the cross and crossing cursors. Um, but all of this is a real challenge, both from an engineering point of view. How do you make your cursor aware of everything? And you drag a window around and all the targets change. You, you minimize or maximize a window, all the targets change. Um, it's an engineering challenge for sure. And so those techniques, you can see the bubble and the crossing cursors, those are target aware. Target agnostic is only privy to the cursor kinematics. It's position, velocity, acceleration, and so forth. And uh, maybe there's hybrid approaches that could put us in between these extremes, but that's a lot, in a way, a lot less information than up above. Up above, you certainly have this, and you have a lot more. There are many, many techniques in the literature in the top portion. I can only count four or five in the world that are target agnostic. And I'm going to show you two of them today. Um, the one that everyone uses is, remember that checkbox, enhanced pointing, pointer precision on the Windows control panel I showed you? That's pointer acceleration, which gives you a nonlinear transfer function that makes far targets easier to get to, but allows you to still get small targets or 
uh, targets very close by with small movements. So that's a target agnostic technique we all pretty much use, even if you don't appreciate it. But it's not, it's not just an engineering challenge. It's actually a theoretical one. What is a target here? I mean, you have a class project, go build this. Go build a target aware technique. You can even own the environment. I'll give you full omniscient knowledge of this screen. What's a target? I can double click in the margins and get a margin dialog. Uh, is it every character? Is it the space between characters where the cursor, the text cursor goes? Is it every word, every paragraph? That's an image. Is it every pixel in the image? Probably not. Maybe it's the image as a whole. I'm not sure what a target is here. What about here? So if you say it's only the appointments I made, I can no longer click on a space to make a new appointment. But if you say it's every half hour slot, why isn't it every hour slot or less than half hour slot? Um, it, I'm not saying there are no solutions to this problem, but I think it's a challenge. Yeah. So, yeah. Some, some of us have been over this, and mm -hmm. uh, with text, you know, horizontal and vertical are very interesting, mm -hmm. right? And sure. that was one of the ways I didn't get into product one time. <laughs> <laughs> it was, was, I, was I was too target uh, aware. Okay. Right? And, yeah. and, you know, trying to make something that can draw is target unaware, yeah. and also select text. Yes. That's interesting. Horizontal and vertical are really yeah. nice things for text. Right, sure. Yeah. So, and I think the point here is in just two examples, we can see the challenge of this kind of definition, this operational definition. I will say I'm working uh, closely with James Fogarty and Morgan Dixon, who are uh, at University of Washington, on uh, extending their prefab system, which can try to recognize targets from the pixels drawn on the screen, to enable us to resolve this kind of question through uh, users being able to provide some input and correct the system when it's wrong and things like that. So we might see some results there soon. Um, but for now, I think it's still a theoretical kind of problem. You have to have some way of defining that issue. The nice thing about the visual motor magnifier that did well in those studies was that it can be made target agnostic, except you can't have that. Now, you can't have the inset bubble cursor, but you can still make the lens. So we did. So here's the pointing magnifier. You can go download and play with it. What's nice uh, for us already is we have another one of those little transfer stories from assistive technology to the general public. Turns out that some graphic designers or maybe they're the only ones who post on Slashdot, I don't know. But those that did said they really like this because it gives them a lens to make sure their, their pixel-perfect alignment in their designs is right. And upon writing that, they're like, why doesn't that exist already as a tool in something like Photoshop? Now, maybe some of you know it does. You can certainly zoom the whole canvas, right? But this is kind of a, a configurable lens that allows you to, to, uh, to just uh, magnify the area that's clicked on. And uh, PC World covered this as, as well as a technique I'll show you in a few minutes. And uh, it's a little scary because they do this review, you know, one to five, how good is it thing. And they gave us five, so that was nice. Um, but uh, I think it's getting some attention, so that's great. Uh, let's see, time for a demo. Okay, what I'll do in my demo, which won't be very full featured, is, so this is the configuration dialog for the thing, and I'll just stay here. Um, but you can see, you know, it kind of behaves like the pictures would suggest, right? So you can click, and you can resize, and you can uh, uh, push buttons, and you can re redefine the... Oops, redefine the um, hot key that turns it on and off, off, on, so forth. But you, you can get uh, the, the level of magnification that you'd like. Uh, hopefully to you that looks pretty straightforward and, and that's the goal, right? Is to make it simple and easy to use. Uh, so we'll see whether people with disabilities or <laughs> graphic designers end up using it more, but uh, hopefully both. Is there another way to be target agnostic? Well, certainly there is. This is obviously kind of a setup question for the next project, which is the angle mouse. And now we're going to talk even more about motor space without visual uh, magnification. James Fogarty and Susumu Harada, among others, helped me on this work. Uh, so we remember this kind of trace that happens for um, uh, some people with, with, well, maybe all of us would produce traces like this at times, but probably the corrective phase would be much tighter. And we have the ballistic phase and we have our corrective phase that occurs. Um, let's think about this in terms of angles. So it's hard to come up with target agnostic techniques that are worth a penny, uh, and, and all the information you have is just in the cursor. So what are you going to do? Well, we decided to look at angles. What do I mean by angles? So I mean this. It's a little laggy, uh, this video, but it, it was shot in real time. It's just not playing back that way. So I'm projecting angle lines every, I think, eight pixels. And you can see, well, let me ask you, what happens to the angles? The darker lines are more recent. The lighter lines are more old. There's 16 lines. What happens to the angles as the user corrects to get in the target? They kind of like spread out, right? They sort of go everywhere. Versus 
here where the spread is kind of this coherent fan, right? So we can use that kind of information. Now, <laughs> just in case you're wondering, I'm not saying the actual thing in use looks like this. You don't shoot <laughs> rays all over your screen. That's just for uh, illustration. But that's the idea. So I defined a concept called angular deviation, which is like standard deviation, but in vector angle space. And so low deviation, if the trace were like this, we get these angles, that would be fairly low. And during corrective phase motion, we might see high angles or a high spike in deviation. So we can use that. How can we use that? Well, again, we don't know where the targets are. It's totally target agnostic, but we can keep the gain high when movement's fairly coherent, and we can drop the gain when movement is divergent, which, remember the motor space pictures, makes the target bigger on the desk, so to speak, right? So to show it through my little pictures here, the visual space is on the screen, and now we have a dynamic motor space that will actually change during movement according to how we move. So as the corrections happen, uh, the motor space enlarges, making the target bigger. There's more to it uh, than I've said, but that's the gist. One of the things that's more involved is you want the more recent angles to matter uh, than older angles, usually, because uh, as you move, the more recent ones are more indicative of how you're moving more recently. Uh, so we tried different weighting functions uh, to make the thing feel responsive, because if you just treat all angles as equal, you end up with a, a, a real sense of lag from time to time. But at the same time, you want to remember all angles when you're correcting, because those corrections can happen over a period of time. So what we went to is a dynamic weighting function where the angles, uh, in the mathematics, what this produces is a weighted standard deviation calculation which is kind of weird. Weighted means are common, right? But most people don't use weighted standard deviation too often. Uh, but we found an application for it here. And what that means is when movement's fairly coherent, you have a weighting function where the most recent angles matter most. Those are down here. But when I start to correct, I parameterize this function such that it gets mostly flat in the weighting function, which allows all the angles to be taken into account. So what this means is it's very responsive, but the lag is on, any lag that feels like lag would be only right around the target. As soon as you go about your way, it goes away pretty fast. Uh, which was important. So if you play with it, you might, you know, feel that. Again, we ran a study, eight people with and without motor impairments, fairly gender balanced, trackball and mice users. Here we don't need to worry about a random field of targets because this is target agnostic. So there's no notion of really a distractor target. Maybe in the human visual system, but that's, we can ignore that, I think. So we use the ISO standard for the ring of circles task, which is a nice controlled task. And what we found in the end was that we had 10.3% <coughs> better, uh, better throughput for people with motor impairments, those are the, the green figures. And for people without, we had a non-significant difference that was within 1.2% of their uh, throughput performance, their, their speed accuracy combined efficiency. So that shouldn't surprise us. That's exactly actually what I'd expect because the people without motor impairments aren't doing the corrective behavior that causes the angle mouse to kick in. So what this means is it can run in the background and it mostly won't affect you if you don't do the behavior that it, it helps. If you do do the behavior that it helps, then it should kick in and help, hopefully. Right? So that's kind of nice. Uh, there was also a more accurate than the default mouse. Uh, so for people with motor impairments, quite a bit more accurate. We looked at the sub movements and found higher peak velocity and peak acceleration. And that's nice because uh, we want them to be able to move in a kind of confident, accelerated, velo velocityful way. Uh, but then we found fewer corrective sub movements. And we would have expected more sub movements if they're moving with peak velocity and acceleration that are higher. And yet there were fewer. So it seems like it was kind of catching the mouse and working as they work to get in targets. Looking closely at gain change, we can see here's a trial by someone with Friedrich's ataxia. Uh, our software produces these graphs, kind of nice. Uh, and um, we can see uh, it's what it looks up at close. There's some corrective behavior here, not a huge amount, but some. And we can see the, uh, the angular deviation calculation on the top. And as it goes up, uh, the, the uh, gain setting drops. We can deploy this because it's target agnostic. And that's what it looks like. There's some presets where you just say how much corrective behavior you tend to have. And behind that are a bunch of settings that you can customize if you want to get into it. Um, and I think that's enough of cursors, and you probably agree. So let's talk about changing the interface instead. Because I've talked a lot about what's working on the interface, but not the underlying interface. And, and that's an opportunity for improvement as well. So SUPL is a project that was the dissertation work of Christoph Gaius who I mentioned is now at Harvard University, and his uh, other advisor besides me, uh, Dan Weld, who's in artificial intelligence at the University of Washington. <coughs> so you've seen some of these pictures already, the top row, you've seen some of those. Uh, I've added the bottom row to illustrate the general idea, general concept that we all have abilities, 
And uh, we use those abilities in different contexts. And our abilities vary, of course, right? We're all different. And it's not just what's sort of innate to us or inside us, but it's also the context we're in. So the woman on the, the bottom right, for example, is walking with a cell phone. Uh, she might have certain abilities, but in that context, can't exercise them. Her attention's probably dis divided. Uh, her focus has to be, you know, in this case, on the phone. Uh, but she can't walk into poles and bikes and cars and things, so she's got to divide her attention. Uh, and we see that some of the people using trackballs in innovative ways along the top. Clearly, the abilities of this person uh, I, I might have fancied myself to once do that, but I don't think I ever did that, and uh, um, now I'm old anyway. But our computer is, wow, it doesn't, you can barely see. Well, that's kind of what it's like for your computer. It can barely tell what you can do. In fact, it's pretty much, let's do that again because I didn't set it up right. Your computer can't tell anything about your abilities, right? It's pretty much blind to these things. It's unaware of them. And so, uh, what if we had a world like this? What if the world said, or the computer could say, not say, but no, well, your eyesight's 2040 and your throughput is 5.6 bits per second with a mouse, you know. Okay, kind of nerdy, but the point is, what if it could know that? Because it doesn't currently. And even if it did, it can't do anything useful with it. And that leads us to the idea of your own user interface, which uh, we never called it this, but I put it on the slide because I couldn't resist. The UE. Um, okay, I obviously think that's funnier than you do, but uh, <laughs> what if you had your own user interface, right? Your own UI or your UI. Uh, everybody's maybe a little bit different. That's, in fact, what, what we did. So Supple issues a one-time performance test. You could take it again, but the idea is it's a one-time thing, so it won't watch your behavior as you progress. That's a, a, a limitation. But you click in place, you point and click, you drag, and you actually select from lists. We tried to model list selection from its component actions, clicking, dragging, whatever. It's very hard. Actually, the models were very bad. So we uh, decided to model as a composite kind of singular thing. But the point is these performance results get fed into Supple and it computes a cost optimization of the interface. So given an interface with a choice of widgets and layout, how much does it cost in terms of the estimated task completion time? Granted, it's just on the motor dimension. It's not looking at aesthetics or other things. But why this is powerful? Because for years, people have tried to do automatic user interface generation from rules, heuristics, and other kinds of declarative knowledge, and searching over large spaces and things. The cost optimization approach allows us to then compute a cost and try to find the minimal cost for the interface. And that's, in fact, what Supple does. So it has no declarative knowledge of impairments or people. It just uses that performance model. Uh, so here's a default font dialog in Word. You can tell it's not the real one, right? Because Arial's selected, and yet here it says Times New Roman. That's our giveaway. Plus, these are way left. Um, and that's just how we created it. But this is rebuilt in Supple, so Supple can work with it. Uh, and so it, we didn't make the preview of the font functional. Uh, but here's one generated for a person with cerebral palsy. Remember, no declarative knowledge about cerebral palsy. Right? Just the performance model. And what we see are larger targets, more spacing between targets, uh, but the use of tabs to group things because they can't all fit on one screen because they're bigger and more spread out. Here, by contrast, is one for a person with muscular dystrophy. No declarative knowledge about muscular dystrophy, but things are now close together and small because people with muscular dystrophy have slow movements, but they're generally fairly accurate and no tabs, so they don't have to keep switching and moving long distances between tabs in the interface. Uh, we had a study, again, uh, six people without, 11 people with motor impairments, fairly gender balanced, risks, uh, gender balanced and uh, <coughs> mice and trackballs, and we guided them through the interfaces generated for them and, and the manufacturer's defaults, uh, as well as some interfaces generated just by their preferences, not by their performance. And we'd say, we'd highlight a box and say, select Epson Stylus. So they would click that. And as soon as they're done successfully, it would move them to the next element. So it was pretty much just a motor task, uh, a little bit of visual recognition, but not, not a huge amount. Check the box and so forth. What we found is that these user interfaces, compared to the defaults, the manufacturer's default, were 28% faster for people with um, motor impairments, but 18% faster for people without. Uh, so that's just saying that the default dialogues are maybe not um, designed to optimize this, and that's no surprise. Uh, 77, 76% fewer errors. So what's nice about this is we don't have a speed accuracy trade-off, which is like the bane of this whole area of work. You always get a speed accuracy trade-off. Here we have win-win. That's nice. And uh, people with motor impairments significantly prefer the interfaces generated for them. Again, their performance, their preference following their performance. People without motor impairments did not show a significant preference any which direction, uh, which is kind of also interesting. There's a nice video of Supple online. You can look at that. And um, it leads us to some questions. 
you know, what about going beyond just motor skills? Because clearly, some of those supplement interfaces are pretty ugly, partly because we had to use the, I think it's the chrome or silver toolkit uh, 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 skin within uh, Java because that's what we could resize buttons to be bigger and stuff. A lot of those toolkits don't allow for that. So they kind of looked ugly. So what about aesthetic concerns? What about other abilities like visual ability or hearing? Can you imagine getting the little E test? Like you go home, you install Windows or you run it for the first time and up pops that little E, you know, sideways E test and you're like, you know, sit this far from your computer and, and tell us what letters you see. I don't know if anybody would do that. I certainly wouldn't really want to, but maybe if the gains were good enough, I would bother. Um, you could certainly do a hearing test with headphones on a computer. In fact, that's probably how they're administered now. Uh, cognitive tests. Um, what about changing abilities over time, right? This was kind of a static snapshot, but people's abilities often change over time, even within a day. If I take medication, it lowers my tremor. I go off the medication or it wears off and tremor comes back. That's a lot to address. Uh, ability measurement in the wild is something I'm working on now. How do we tell what people are doing from just everyday computer use with no task model, no orange target in a sea of gray ones? How do you tell? You have no notion of their intention. They might get up to go to the restroom. They might change their mind about what they're typing. How do you, how do you know? Uh, and the general idea of an ability profile, there's some security and privacy concerns here. But if our ability profiles could be up on the web or somewhere accessible by everything we interact with, could those things that, with which we interact uh, tailor themselves better to meet our needs because our ability profile is available and constantly being updated? So the last thing I want to mention today is ability-based design, which is <coughs> in its early, early stages. We do have one uh, journal article on this. It's a conceptual article, so it doesn't uh, uh, go through specific technologies other than to point out design principles. Sean Kane, Christoph Gaio, Susima Arata, and John Freilich were part of this work. So I, you've heard me today say a lot about disability, a lot about ability, uh, but the very fact that we make a distinction here, I think is a little bit, uh, well, it's worth reconsidering. So we say, well, we look at that and we say, oh, ability, uh, and clearly lots of abilities, great abilities. And, and this kind of uh, abstract photo here, you say, well, there's something about disability there, right? But actually, of course, there's something about ability there too. Um, every person has abilities, and isn't it just the case that they're abilities and they're abilities? They're different. Uh, there are probably a lot of things that you could fill in someone there could do that this person can't. There's clearly things this person can do that most any of us can't. Um, but I think the landscape is one of ability, not this kind of artificial dichotomy about ability and disability. And it might be like, you know, if we said Danny DeVito has dis height, you know, relative to Arnold Schwarzenegger. I don't know if this is like a promo photo for that old movie, was it Twins? Yeah, yeah I think it might have been. But, you know, he's clearly shorter, but everybody's height, it's just some people have more than others. Everybody has some money, well, maybe not everybody, but most people have some money, some people have more than others. Dis money is not a term we use. Um, I, I think it's just sort of an interesting uh, thing to, to reflect on the, the way we refer to ability and disability as if there's some kind of dichotomy. Um, and I don't think it's just a word game. I really don't believe this is just a semantic kind of word game. The functional approach to uh, restoring someone's uh, abilities uh, goes something like this. This is kind of in broad strokes and it's probably too simple, but you know, we, we tend to sort of regard this mythical average user which doesn't exist. No one's average anything. And, um, but we have this idea of a kind of an average user. And we sort of do this implicit diff. Uh, someone with disabilities, maybe a specific person or a group of people. And we say, okay, well, that results in a set of things that this person with disabilities can't do. And we don't do this maybe consciously, but we, the, the field of assistive technology, especially out of the World War II era and the development of that, has is, is kind of had this tone, I think. And so then we say, okay, let's compare that to the requirements of the system, meaning what does the system require to be operated? How, what, what, is, what are the demands on the user to operate the system, right? And then we say, okay, well, now we need to figure out what functions must be restored in the user to operate the system. And I think already that should strike us as a, a sort of heavily biased approach. The system is free to be as it is. System, you're sort of like protected from any notion of change. We're gonna change the person to conform to what you need. So if you say you gotta press keys to enter text, we're gonna make you press keys. Right? Now we've evolved beyond that issue to some extent, but I think we generally adopt a certain um, kind of approach in this way. Ability-based design, and not just ability-based design, but I think um, 
uh, in general, as we begin to think about new ways of doing this, we first take away this comparison because it's not very meaningful anyway. And we say, here's a user, a specific user, maybe even a single person is best. And we say, what are the set of things that user with abilities can do? Right? And then we don't compare it to their demands that the system places. We just say, let's consider what the user's desired outcomes are. What are they trying to accomplish with something? And maybe not even that. Maybe it's something else would be better for that. But what are they trying to accomplish? What's the desired outcomes? And then we don't have to ask, well, what functions have to be restored in that user because we've no longer set about identifying what they lack. We've identified what they have, what they are, what they can do. And so that goes away. And we say, let's instead consider how should the system be designed for the user to achieve these outcomes um, using the abilities we've identified. And this is a very open design question. right? And maybe that's not even the right system for it. That flips the arrow, I think. Uh, where the burden becomes placed more here. We can say, f you know, flip the burden. Uh, the burden is more on the designers, on the system. But, of course, there's a lot of drawbacks to this, too. One of which is, how, can, how in the heck can we support, if this was a single person, every system's going to be designed differently for every single person with disabilities or, or abilities of any kind, right? That's not going to scale. There's not enough designers in the world, <laughs> for one thing. And so then this led to, you know, I think that recognition led to, well, universal design says, let's just design so the most people in general can use it. Uh, which I think inevitably prescribes a little bit of a lowest common denominator thing. I mean, it doesn't try to, but I think it's a little bit of an inevitability. Design for all, you know, that's a phrase we hear. And that avoids this, everyone needs their own interface thing. I'm not sure these are achievable anyway. But actually, we're not prescribing that at all. I'm prescribing, in thinking about ability-based design, a universal application of design for one. So not universal design, but the universal application of the concept of design for one. This phrase itself is not one I came up with. Uh, uh, Simon Harper in 2007 has, has published an article about that idea. Uh, but without really an approach to achieving it. And I think that's obviously where the, the big money uh, research-wise lies. So one approach I think you saw today in Supple and in some of the other techniques to a lesser degree um, but let's illustrate it this way. This is, these are through some symbols from Alistair Edwards way back in the 90s. Um, but I've repurposed them for my, for my purposes. An ideal situation in some sense is a user whose abilities uh, fits nicely with the system, right? Kind of a match there, if you'll tolerate my little geometric uh, example. Uh, a the functional approach I described kind of leads to this, right? Where you have a user in a system, and they don't quite match. See, the, the user now is uh, a different shape. But the adaptation allows them to kind of fit in. And is this a bad thing? I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it leads to a certain design approach, which is to figure out how the system can remain as it is and have no idea that any intermediary is being used. That's not part of the system. It has to be procured separately. It may cost a lot. It may be a completely separate thing. It may not fit as perfectly as the picture implies. And it goes kind of in between. And if it breaks down, the user's out of luck. Right? Um, and an ability-based system says, ah, the system takes the responsibility of becoming fit to the user. So the fitness direction flips back, right? And Supple tried to do that in a, in a narrow and limited way, but a, a beginning. I think other things that adapt can do that, but it's not just an adaptation, especially automatic. It's even just adaptability. Let the user configure it to meet their needs. That's OK. But we haven't explored a broad range of adaptable systems, I think. Um, uh, we've just explored it adaptation a lot, but not necessarily adaptability in general that could be part user-driven, part system-driven. So I think what this amounts to, at some level, is at least trying to push for a little bit of a change in focus. And changes in focus can have profound, profound impacts on how we do our work, how we look at our data, how, how we fit our models. This is uh, from the 1500s, mid-1500s. And if you look closely at the center, you'll see that's, that's certainly the Earth, not the Sun. And this is a model of the solar system. Uh, this is the Ptolemaic view of the universe. And the Earth is in the center, right? And changes in focus can be profound. Uh, this is quite beautiful, I think, but certainly not uh, correct from an empirical standpoint. Neither is this exactly correct, but it's closer where the sun is now in the center. Of course, this is the Copernican view. It's the same data. They fit all the data to this model. They had to introduce a bunch of funny stuff to make it fit, but they fit it. And the model had elements and things in it it shouldn't. They had to fit the same data here. It's the same data, but they're looking at it through a different focus. Of course, this isn't right either. The orbits aren't circular and so forth, but it's closer. Now, if you're saying, okay, that's, that's nice, Dr. Wobrock, way to bring in the big lofty example at the end. I think our field has this. 
I don't think this is just something physicists get to enjoy or astronomers. I think we've had big changes in focus. So tolerate the hokey uh, clip art for a minute, but we used to design systems this way. I mean, I was young. I, that's just what I'm told. But when I took CS147, that's what Terry taught me. We used to design systems this way, right? We had the system in the middle, and then suddenly someone said, and more than just someone, uh, a lot of people said, including Terry Winograd and a lot of others, uh, probably most uh, famous article in this one area is go the Golden Lewis article from 85, but the user should be in the center of a design process. Okay, now all of you are like, boring, I've heard that so many times, I'm sick of it. Yeah, but it's still a big change in focus. This difference is enormous, right? So, I think changes in focus can make a big difference. We did develop some pr uh, principles of ability-based design. Uh, I haven't talked about all of them except just the first today. We had three kind of categories. Stance was the designer's approach to the problems. Interface and the system, uh, apart from the interface. We really only say the first two have to be required. I know I'm talking and you're trying to read. Don't worry about it. Uh, if you really care, you can look it up. But uh, I have talked today about the first principle, the focus. Designers will focus on ability, not disability, striving to leverage all that a user can do. All is a big word. All a user can do. That might lead us to look at users in different ways, look at things they can do in different ways, and go beyond uh, kind of the functional restorative point of view. Now, uh, a lot of you are computer scientists, and you might think, well, this is interesting maybe, but uh, what are the research opportunities here? I think they're ample for even the most hardcore computer scientists can get into this stuff. So characterizing ability is itself a challenge. And that's not just a computer science question about how to measure and test and, and detect and sense, but also uh, psychologists and human factors kind of question. Naturalistic ability measurement. I mentioned I'm working on a project on that right now. But how do you measure things apart from task models and knowing the user's intention? Inferring the intention of the user in the wild, it's kind of like saying, read their mind. What are they trying to do? That should sound hard because it's, well, it's impossible in the limit. but. Sensing and responding to context, our context changes, that changes uh, our abilities, that changes how we can uh, act on things. Mapping between abilities and design. Ability modeling is a question. How do we model abilities? How do we predict performance from those models? Um, we didn't use Fitts Law for some of the people with disabilities because it just did not model their motor performance well. Adaptive and adaptable interfaces I've mentioned. How do you preview settings that aren't visual? Especially with this, all this motor space stuff I mentioned. That's just one example. But if things aren't visual, how do you preview them? You know, the whole office product suite now previews everything as you hover over it. Sometimes it's annoying. Things are jumping and whatever. But you just move away and it goes back the way you had it, hopefully. But if it's non-visual, how do you show people the effect of their settings? And I think there's a lot of room for hardware to make a difference here, too. Although it would maybe, for a while, at least break the everyday input devices uh, motivation. In conclusion, uh, I've tried to talk today about a number of things. One of which is everyday input devices and the need uh, to leverage things that people have already in innovative ways. I've talked about new ways of doing an old thing. Um, that's, that's an old thing to acquire targets, but it's, it's uh, still an important area that's underserved, I think. Real world deployments, you can download these and try them. If you don't have a motor impairment and find they don't help you, don't be too surprised. They might not be for you. Uh, but if you're a graphic artist, maybe that's helpful, the pointing magnifier. Shift in focus, we talked about here at the end. And in the end, I wanna leave you with the question, how do you best support a, a range of user abilities? I think it's time that computers are no longer completely in the dark about what we can do and that all the burden is on us to uh, comply with them. Acknowledgements, National Science Foundation grants, Microsoft and Intel, thank you to them and thank you to you. <laughs> we have about six minutes or so. Six minutes of questions and then we can also ask some questions after that. Mm -hmm. Have you worked with any of these uh, target aware um, systems that basically had gravity? So as you moved your cursor, it would, it would sort of be attracted to the nearest target? We have, uh, we have prototypes of a lot of these things and have played with those kinds of adaptations. And, you know, the lab studies on those are, are, are old and been around a long time and generally show some benefit depending on how the study was set up. Although distractor targets in those cases are really problematic, of course. Um, you can't deploy them, really, so they're of less interest to us. Um. Some of the techniques you were talking about, you were thinking about, reminded me of work that Manu Kumar did here on gaze-based interfaces. Yeah. And we looked at how, we, with gaze, we're all a bit sort of, mm -hmm. what's like spastic, just you know, not as, as right. high control. How do they compare? 
Yeah, I've done uh, eye tracking based research and uh, actually uh, making a version of, of EdgeWrite we called iWrite. This was a number of years ago when I was kind of finishing that work. So um, I got a pretty good sense of how the eye tracking movements uh, look for, for people. It worked well in that case because we had kind of infinite corner targets and there are just four of them. So for iWrite, EdgeWrite, that worked well. Uh, I haven't worked with uh, gaze for uh, targeting. Clearly, there are opportunities there. I'm familiar with the work you mentioned. And the main reason is it still feels to me like we're not quite there from an everyday input devices point of view yet. And we, I really want stuff that, you know, on the one hand, we can push things by being so different and out there that maybe the field can evolve towards it. On the other hand, we can build stuff that we can release now, like some of these techniques. I, I do think with the, release, the recent release of the Lenovo laptop that has eye tracking built in, uh, that, that's going to become an everyday input device soon. And so we should probably start anticipating that and doing some work with that. That's a good suggestion. Any other questions or comments? All right. Um, <laughs> you, I think it's a, it's a nice, it's a nice uh, very nice story that you've told going, going through this uh, progression. And one thing that struck me is that uh, a lot of progress has been made in pointing techniques have been driven by looking at people with uh, different abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, an, another category has been uh, driven by people uh, working on uh, mobile phones and, and other environments where uh, uh, people who are otherwise normal are, in fact, uh, right. disabled one way or the other. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, for example, the, 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 uh, the magnifying cursor that you show mm -hmm. uh, reminded me of, of something within with a, a, a similar technique for, for mobile device to okay. make the, the targets bigger and easier. Sure. Um, my question was about this, this business of target aware versus target uh, agnostic because every time I see an economy like this, I think, well, it's a nice starting point, but is there a space in the middle? Yeah. Um, and, and one thing we, and, and I had never thought about it this way, but uh, we did this thing called the uh, Dinospot version, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which in fact uh, is target aware, mm -hmm. but also allows you to click at any pixel on the screen, and, and therefore is also target uh, agnostic. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there is just some interesting space there where, you know, you don't have to know all the targets on the screen mm -hmm. to uh, improve a particular technique sure. uh, if, if you think of, of the two situations. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if it's something you have uh, looked into, and if some of your techniques would, would sort of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, match this kind mm -hmm. of approach. Yeah, that's a great... Uh, Great set of points, I guess. Um, I'm familiar with the work you mentioned, and I, I, I like it very much. I agree that there is a middle ground. I think even when I first mentioned I said there might be some, some space in between. Uh, and, and I think that's actually a really fertile area to explore because we can get about 70% of the targets from the accessibility API on Windows, which isn't 100, but that doesn't mean we can't look at, at using them, right, at least. And uh, also, I think that uh, soon we may have some ability to do some more of the target location stuff with the work from, from James Fogarty and Morgan Dixon, and I'm getting to help them as well. So I think there'll be some more, more fluidity between those two dichotomies. I, I agree with that. Um, I do think with the pointing magnifier, we probably could stick the bubble cursor inside the lens because now we have a fairly limited space. We have to search and figure out what's in there. And, and uh, the, the trick, though, is if we do that and we just use it as a normal bubble cursor, There'll be targets. If it doesn't see them, we can't actually click on them, unlike the Dynaspot where we could still. So uh, there's probably some room there to, to massage that difficulty. But yeah, your point's well taken. <coughs> I'm thinking about the fact that when you're using a mouse, one of the lovely things is you can put the heel of your hand down and get all this tremendous mm -hmm. advantage compared mm -hmm. to when you're, when you're just moving with your whole arm. And that is a lot of, you know, a, lot of a huge uh, change in, yeah. in the in the pointing device, actually. Right. Um, and I, I, I almost wanted to have such things that I'm, I'm mm -hmm. putting under my hand. Mm -hmm. You know, in two-handed pointing research, we always did that kind of stuff. What do you think about, you know, I saw you, you know, with that pushing the switches. What do you think yeah. about m changing mm -hmm. from a one, a one cursor to some mm -hmm. supported cursor mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. paradigm? You know, I, ha I can't say I played with that idea directly, but in, in all the cases we've seen, like with barrier pointing and the mobile devices and the styli and the finger on the screen, any stabilizing plane, plane you know, planar surface, is just always going to be a win. I mean, I've never seen it not help. And so um, I think there's a que design question, clearly, of how to best integrate that to a, a real device or a real setup. But uh, it's, just, it's just so helpful to have edges and corners or a planar surface and things. So, 
Um, I think that's a great place to start sniffing around. I mean, it's, it's a little bit untouched in the design space. Yeah. Maybe, maybe one, time for one more. Can you talk for a minute about the work you've done on mobile phones and pointing in particular on touch base? Yeah, uh, I can briefly. So uh, a couple projects come to mind. Um, one is, uh, actually, Michelle mentioned this. Uh, and I mentioned the woman walking with the cell phone, this idea that you're impaired by situation. We've been calling those situational impairments, uh, uh, kind of a shorthand. Andrew Sears first mentioned that, I think, as situational impairments and disabilities, but that's too much of a mouthful. Uh, and in that work, we actually explored something called walking user interfaces, where we actually had the camera on the bottom of an ultra mobile PC tell if you're walking or not based on the visual field change, and then adapt the, the, the interface on the screen accordingly, right? So um, the idea was it was a level of detail ad adaptation. So it was not r really uh, sophisticated, but it did allow uh, more targets when you're standing still, uh, greater information density, fewer when you're walking. And, and we found you know, nicely that people did uh, improve uh, relative to their current situation based on the interface that they were given. It wasn't quite as clean a sort of victory as we might like, but it was, it was there. I think we need to do more in that space. In general, uh, on the move kind of interfaces, I think, are fairly underexplored so far. So that's one mobile case. Another one we did for, for blind people um, where it's called Slide Rule, and it's actually become part of what uh, uh, we learned from an Apple engineer, part of what they integrated into VoiceOver, which is the iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad accessibility feature. And this was the idea that uh, you could read the screen with a finger. Uh, we called it the reading finger. And then your off, an off uh, finger, like your thumb usually, or a second finger, would be the one that would trigger a target. But it's targeting the thing under the first finger. Sounds complicated, it actually works really nicely. So you read the screen in whatever order you want. The longer you stay in a position, the more it would read from that point, kind of a verbal level of detail, audio level of detail adjustment. So if you go quickly down a list, you might just get the first letter of each people's name. If you dwell, you get their full name. Uh, but to target something, you don't want to have to pe have people lift because they lose their orientation. So they stay down and then just trigger with an off finger. It doesn't matter where that hits, so there's no targeting involved, and it triggers the thing under the reading finger. Uh, simple. Kind of, right? Uh, but actually, the basis for voiceover on, uh, on all the touch screen devices now. Yeah. So that was nice. We didn't patent it or anything, but oh well. It's okay. So. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thanks. 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 For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.